The Dental Brief is brought to you by Omni Premier Marketing and the amazing guests who bring wisdom and advice that you can put to use to take your business and practices to the next level. Find us on Facebook and join the conversation. Get ready to grow because we are kicking off the next episode in three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Dental Brief. I have either a third or fourth time returning guest on the program. I'm going to have to get some kind of a special jacket like they do on Saturday Night Live. Addison Kalian, Dr. Addison Kalian, say hello to everyone. Hey, thanks for having me on here. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I think when like Steve Martin or one of those super famous guys goes on SNL, they get like a smoking jacket. So yeah, anytime I could get a jacket with some a smoke machine underneath it, I'll take it. Uh, glad to be <laughs> yeah, on with you, man. Yeah, so I, I love having you here. Um, for those of the, that don't know, you have an incredibly successful practice in Nebraska. Tell us a little bit about your practice and kind of your journey to where you're at right now. Yeah, so I was really uh, unique and innovative, and I copied everything that I saw from some of my friends that were doing things really well, actually. So I just said, hey, like, I, I see all my friends and people that I would coach and talk with every month um, doing really cool things. And so I started my practice back in 2019 and I used to own six practices and I said, Hey, I hate the life of trying to balance six different balls in the air, juggling all these practices. So we did one location. Uh, now we're up to five doctors. It's in uh, one kind of strip mall facing a main thoroughfare in town, which is just two miles from my house, which I love. And yeah. uh, you know, I still do clinical uh, three days a week, sometimes more. Uh, I love doing clinical. It's just, it's actually the easier part of my week now, but, um, we do IV sedation. We do kind of a lot of the more, you know, complex procedures, endo implants, um, a lot of surgery and, uh, yeah, I just have a lot of fun. Although, you know, I'm, I'm willing to try anything to grow the practice. Obviously being a startup, you have to try to throw a lot of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. And so we've tried a lot of things. Um, granted, it was also during a time of excessive growth, uh, at least after being shut down for two months and having that pucker moment of 2020 in the spring yep. when the whole world was shut down. Uh, ever since then, it's been crazy growth. And so, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I've got, yeah, four great doctors that work with me. And yeah, so it's it's just I enjoy going to work every day. And, and dentistry is still a passion project. And that's why I like writing books and seeing patients all at the same time sometimes. Yeah. I, I think you and I first met about two and a half, three years ago, I think was the first time you're in the program. I know you had, I believe a couple of associates at that time. I think since then you've added a couple more and you've also knocked down some walls or some added some square footage to your practice as well. Is that, is that right? Yeah. So we, we started with six operatories and two doctors yep. and then yeah, knocked down a wall, added five more and then knocked down another wall and added three more. So wow. up to 14 now. That's awesome. You're, you're obviously doing something right. You know, something that I, I really enjoy uh, about uh, conversing with you is that, you know, you're a very laid back person, right? I mean, if, for those of you that are listening, you got a sweatshirt on, you got your hat on backwards, right? But when it comes to business, I don't know anybody that runs their business as tight as you do. So I think there's some good things for us to talk about here. And we were talking a little bit before we got going on, you know, when you started, there was a lot of money running around, right? So, and we had the shutdown, but then soon after the shutdown, there was, everybody had cash falling out of their pockets for a period of time and yeah. dentistry boomed. And now I think we're seeing a slowdown. I'm seeing, we get more calls for people asking for help than we ever have before. Um, what are you seeing? What are you, what are you talking? You're coaching, you're talking to dentists. What are you seeing across the board? Yeah. I mean, I think for the last three or four years, people have just been like, man, there's new patients flowing in the door. I don't know how to get them in. And I think that was, you know, after COVID, a lot of older dentists retired. And maybe a, a six-month hiatus and people kind of missing some appointments gave them an opportunity to try out a new dentist um, or switch dentists or switch their providers. And when that happened, a lot of people, you know, tried new practices. And so there's a lot of new patient flow, um, yeah. a lot of free money, obviously, out there, low interest rates. Um, well, now we're not in that environment anymore. And I've gotten, just like you, a lot of calls recently from dentists who are freaking out. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, you know, we're talking to a group of dentists and I said, okay, how many of you are, were practicing in 2008? Not many. How many of you were practicing in February or March of 2020? You know, a lot more, but then there's still a lot of these newer doctors in the last five years that have come out 
who weren't really practicing at that point in time. And they're wondering, oh my gosh, my patients aren't accepting as much treatment. They seem to, like the well seems to have dried up. Now, what I see from people's statistics across the country, and um, I see quite a few practices in their numbers, and I, I love digging into it because when you start to see, you know, a short-term, like week-to-week, month-to-month trend, it could be a blip on the radar. You know, what's the signal? What's the noise? Sure. Well, now we're starting to see a signal. And the signal is people are getting more frugal. Uh, treatment acceptance rates are starting to dip. Now, not significantly, but, you know, 10 to 15% across the board in almost every geography um, from patient acceptance rates. And so where you previously were at 85% patient acceptance, so 85 out of 100 patients would accept something when you presented a treatment plan. Well, now we're talking 72 or 70%. And so that patient acceptance drop, uh, it's not the patients don't like you, but if their copays are more than a couple hundred dollars, they're choosing to delay treatment and right. or try to, to figure out. So when we go through that, I my point to them is like, well, this isn't a reason to freak out, but it is a reason to kind of double down on your operations and your sure. primarily your systemization. So why, I mean, we, we can make all these assumptions on why patients are not wanting to schedule their next appointment, but I kind of go down to my top list of, of things that when something is dropping like this, we need to focus on our treatment planning and follow-up skills. And right. so for me, it's, I mean, what do really good doctors do? Well, they educate. They talk in layman's terms to their patients. They show pictures. They tell patients, you know, why they need treatment. They show them why, if they don't get treatment, what's going to happen. You know, all these points about just making sure the patient really understands what's going on here. Right. Um, so they educate really well. And then next, they educate on the costs. So in order for you to adequately close a patient's treatment or, you know, get them on the books for their appointment, patient's going to want to know the costs. And part of that is getting their insurance card before they come in. So like, hey, text us a copy of your card. Make sure we get it in our system. We pre-check your benefits, all those sorts of things. You know, it's difficult. I mean, sometimes it's royal pain in the butt, but you need to have accurate insurance breakdowns so that they understand what their financial impact is. Um, right. And they really, you really need to get it before they come in. So sure. educating them on the clinical reasons, then the financial impact is huge. Um, right. And then ne next up, I mean, free money, it's, you know, it's not around as much. So people are probably going to need more financing. Right. You know, whether that's one of these third party like care credit, uh, cherry, which, sunbit, something like which, this. Which I'm I've sure... heard and I, I don't I've heard, by the way, sorry to interrupt you, but I've I've heard that patient mm -hmm. financing approval rates are actually down. I don't know if that's the case or not. It wouldn't make sense to me. I actually had a credit card that I didn't use in I don't know, five years. They sent me a letter like, Hey, we're shutting your card down because you don't use it. I'm assuming they're just yeah. being tighter in general. Um, so I'm I'm wondering if that are you seeing that at all? Are you hearing that at all? I'm well, yeah, this increase in, um, well, the, the prior increase in, you know, uh, the federal overnight reserve rate. Um, I mean, a lot of companies got used to that. Well, when they dropped it, uh, recently, it actually put a pinch on a lot of credit card companies. And right. I know of at least one that was basically saying we need to spin down operations and go bankrupt unless we find someone to acquire us because the credit, uh, rot rate swap was actually putting them in a negative position. Right. And so, and a lot of patients come in and they think, well, my credit score is good. I'm uh, 650. No, it's actually 580. And even the <laughs> low end of the credit spectrum doesn't want to insure you or cover, right. your, cover your debt. Uh, so a lot of patients, they think they have decent credit. <laughs> Unfortunately, they don't. So, right. I mean, one tactical way to overcome that is when they come in, just say, okay, well, how much would you be able to do in a down payment? And if it's right. like, you know, a thousand dollar treatment and they could put down 300, 400, maybe that's a risk you want to take in as the practice as internal financing. Like, Hey, let's pay right. that out over the next three months on a credit card. Or maybe you still want to push it to care credit and take a, a financing hit of 10% or 12% something. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Well, and, and of course, then you're still going to get people that once you educate them on their clinical, educate them on their finances and 
offer financing options, they're still going to say no. Right. And that's when it really becomes an operational um, pain in the butt, really. And so I guess in our group, we always talk about the 222 method, which is follow up two days later, two weeks later, two months later. And, you know, you follow up three times. You're doing this for their benefit and you're trying to educate them on, hey, if we don't get this done soon, it could actually become a more costly item. Um, right. But you're looking out for their best interest. Um, and so that's really the operational system that you need to focus on if you're seeing this patient acceptance rate drop is finding a way to follow up with them, whether you have softwares that help you out, whether you have just internal paper systems. I know there's tons of people do it all different ways, but no matter how you do it, you got to follow up. Right. Yeah. I think that makes sense. If you're not, if it's, if it truly is a concern, you don't follow up. I think all you're telling them then is it's not a concern. Right. So if somebody yeah. had a cut break line and you couldn't get a hold of them, you would keep calling them and texting and calling and, and texting them until you, <laughs> you got in touch with them. So I think that's that's pretty important for sure. Now, in in all of this, and I know you're you're very SOP driven, right? You have uh, I think a bad you have you have uh, some amazing books that you can purchase as well. Um, our listeners can purchase. Um, you can't really increase the size of the pie, right? So there's only going to be so much dental treatment going around, but you can increase, I'm sorry, you, you can increase the size of the pie, but you can increase the size of your slice of the pie. Would you agree with that? Is that pretty fair? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, in essence, you could take a red ocean approach and just say, well, there's only so many patients going out there for treatment. And I would agree to that to a certain extent, but when you offer better financing options, there's a certain segment of the population that can only afford a hundred bucks a month for any extra medical costs yeah. and the blue ocean strategy or the, you know, the abundance mindset is that you got to go get those patients. So you got to convince them to come in for their appointments, help them utilize their insurance benefits and come up with a solution that fits their budget of a hundred dollars a month. And when you can do that, you'll both get the new patient and you'll get them to accept that second appointment or third appointment. Um, right. But if you falter in offering that financing option, you know, they'll, you'll tell them they have an infected tooth and you'll never see them again. Right. What percentage of practices do you think are not offering finances, uh, offering financing or saying, Hey, did you try this? Did you look at this when it comes to treatment? I think it's pretty high oh. because I'll ask and they're like, yeah, no, we don't do that. Oh, I bet 60 or 70%. So, yeah. and of course there's different financing partners. I don't, I'm not, I'm agnostic to all of them, but there are different ones that work well in lower dollar ranges and then different ones that are, deal in high dollar ranges and then vice versa, uh, lower credit scores versus higher credit scores. And so as long as you have a different mixture of partners who will finance that cover kind of all four quadrants, you know, that's what you want. Um, but also, and I, this is where I'm not agnostic is that you don't want to have a recourse option. If a right. patient doesn't pay, you still want to have your money. You don't ever want to get that bill later on that says, well, the patient defaulted on their loan, write us back a check for 2000 bucks. That right. sucks. And so right. um, just and keep that, really that hurts. one in house, right? Yeah. So, right. so I mean, you're basically make just... sure that any financing is non-recourse so that right. you take the percentage hit on the front end, but you don't have to worry about it after that. Right. If there's recourse, you might as well just turn it into house financing, right? You might as well just take exactly. the payments yourself instead of involving a third company. And, I think at that and point. And charge a pretty healthy interest rate yourself too. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. Have a cash price and have a financing price, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so I, I actually, I want, you know, when I'm talking to um, dentists that we work with uh, that are considering work with, there's a couple of things that you do as far as uh, bringing in patient referrals. So getting more referrals from your current patients that I always share with them. Tell me what you're doing new. What have you been doing in the last two, three, four, five, six months to help increase the amount of referrals that you're getting in your practice? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's all for me about the patient experience and just making sure it's fantastic. Um, that's one of our core values. We harp on it all the time. Yeah. Um, a, I mean, you should always just make sure they have a positive kind of dopamine rush right at the end of their appointment, um, that it gets them going out, gets them telling their friends, it gets them to either post a positive review or a positive experience on Facebook. Um, 
And it's usually a patient gift right at the end of their appointment. Now we don't do this reciprocity thing where we don't say, do this for me, I'll do that. It's all about just creating a fantastic experience. And so we always give out either a little Yeti stainless steel mug, um, which is like a five to $6 one. We order by the thousands from Alibaba um, labeled with our little thing. It's, it's cool. Uh, it's just like a $25 Yeti mug from the hardware store. Sure. Uh, we also do t-shirts. So like this is one of our t-shirts. It says Smile Lincoln on it. Um, got a cool little image. Now Smile Lincoln is not the name of the practice. It's just a very community centric, cool yeah. looking shirt. On right. the back is my little logo. So people are walking billboard for me, but they still think it's cool looking shirt. Right. Um, and granted t-shirts are about $8 all in. Uh, or a bottle of wine with our sticker on the front wrapped in what a clear cellophane. And that's maybe a four to $5 cost. So yeah. at the end of our new patient appointment, we always give away a nice gift. And um, we always offer like, Hey, you know, we just appreciate your referrals. Uh, we want you to have a great experience here and here's your gift. And then yeah. out the door. Um, and just focusing on that, um, planting a little seed subtleties um, and it works really well. Yeah. Makes total sense to me. So people want to get in touch with you. They, they want to talk to you about uh, coaching or getting help with uh, anything that is going on in a practice. What's the best way for people to reach out to you? Yeah. Uh, my website, addisonkilleen.com. So A-D-D-I-S-O-N-K-I-L-L-E-E-N.com. Uh, they can find all my books on Amazon. Um, yeah. And I'd love to, you know, help out. I love digging into numbers. I have tons of people reach out to me all the time asking for like, um, guidance on, you know, what range should be. And yeah, I love helping out. So reach out anytime. Appreciate you. I appreciate you coming on Dr. Killeen. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks.